The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are simply that, opinions. All are presumed innocent until proven otherwise in a court of law. Sensitive topics are discussed. Discretion is advised. On this week's Court TV podcast, an in-depth look at the dramatic conclusion of the trial that America watched unfold. The Murdoch family murders trial. Alec Murdoch took the stand in his own defense days before a jury found him guilty of killing his wife Maggie and his son Paul after just three hours of deliberations. Did the disbarred attorney's own words end up leading to his conviction? Court TV's Chanley Painter, who was in the low country of South Carolina with me as this verdict came down, joins the show as we unpack the final weeks of this high-profile trial. This is the Court TV Podcast with Vinny Politan. I'm Vinny Politan. Thank you so much for downloading the Court TV Podcast. Great to have you with us. And oh, wow, what a trial. What a tri- epic, epic trial, the Murdoch family murders trial. Um, this is a case that took on a life of its own. It was a trial that was supposed to be relatively long by South Carolina standards, about three weeks, ended up being twice as long and five times as dramatic as I thought it was going to be going in. I knew it was a big story, a big case, a big trial, um, but really evolved into something else. And I want to take an opportunity in this podcast, we're going to go through how things sort of wound up at the end of the trial. And with me is Court TV legal correspondent Chanley Painter, who was down in the low country, is still in the low country as we speak. Uh, I was there for a time with her, especially at the end of this trial. Chanley, uh, great to see you. Um, I'll describe how I feel right now. I am drained. I am drained. And I didn't try the case. I wasn't on trial, but... I was covering this thing, and after that verdict on that Thursday, I woke up Friday, I was drained. Um, We did the shows Friday night, but I can't explain it. It's like this uh, level of adrenaline that sort of leaves your body, then all of a sudden you are just tired. And I'm wondering how you're feeling and the people who actually tried the case and the jurors who actually, you know, came to a decision, how they're feeling now. Yeah, welcome to my weekly life at Court TV after a big verdict and a trial. No, I don't, I barely remember maybe Thursday, Friday, we worked long days, Vinny, and it was just running on the adrenaline, what we live for with the verdict, with sentencing, with trying to gain reaction. And I actually just uh, sat down with Jim Griffin, Alec Murnock's defense attorney. You can tell he's, he's going to take a break after uh, a couple of days. He says he has, he's got to be exhausted. He's exhausted. He's got to be exhausted. You know, he has a sentencing tomorrow. He's still working on other cases. And uh, but he does have a a break coming up. Yeah, I, I was gonna put in for some time off, but I was like, no, I'm just gonna I'm gonna push <laughs> Get in through. Line. It. I'm <laughs> I'm just talking about. It. I'm not trying the case, but I can't explain it. It's unbelievable how the big trial just sort of gets into our blood, and then when when the verdict comes, there's this release of anxiety and tension and everything else. And again, I'm just covering it. I can't imagine the people actually involved. So let's let's break this thing down and let's start because I think this case for this prosecutor, Creighton Waters and his team, was built almost, almost exclusively on the words of Alec Murdoch. I mean, his words, things that he has said since June 7th, and some things that he said before June 7th, but things that he said were the case. Mm-hmm. Am I am I off base here, Chad? No, I completely agree with you. And people I've spoken to agree. The big lie, the new story that he told. I sat down with a couple of the deputies in this case who were there at the, the scene, June 7th, 2021. And they're thankful that those uh, officers who immediately interviewed Alec Murdoch and then the next two times weren't so combative so that he had laid out this story. He was not at the kennel. He was not at the kennel. He was not at the kennels. And suddenly he was at the kennels. There's video proof of that because it seems to be a consensus. That was the strongest piece of evidence for prosecutors and even jurors have cited that who's spoken since the verdict. And you talk about the kennel video being key. The, the, the key part is not the video. 
It's the words of Alec Murdoch. Come here, Bubba. Yep. Bubba, come here, Bubba, calling the dog. It's his voice, his words that undermine his alibi, change the case completely, and demonstrate to the jury firsthand that this guy is a liar. He's a liar about the most important fact of this case, which is where were you when your wife and son were murdered? That's what he lied about. Unbelievable. So let's get to the testimony of Alec Murdoch, because that's something else that obviously the jury uh, took a look at and did not believe. Um, and, and, and I can say they didn't believe him because he did say this. Take a listen. On June 7th, 2021, did you take this gun or any gun like it and shoot your son, Paul, in the chest in the feed room at your property off Moselle Road? No, I did not. Mr. Murdy, did you take this gun or any gun like it and blow your son's brains out on June 7th or any day or any time? No, I did not. Mr. Murdy, did you take 300 blackout such as this and fire it into your wife Maggie's leg, torso, or any part of her body? No. I did not. Did you shoot a 300 blackout into her head, causing her death? Mr. Griffin, I didn't shoot my wife or my son any time. They didn't believe it. They took that as yet another lie by Alec Murdoch, this one on the witness stand during his trial when he chose to take the stand. So as I listen to that now, Chanley, with this verdict in mind, it's to me, it's not a very convincing I did not do it. And I don't know, right? I don't know how an innocent person would say it, but I think that's how a guilty person would say it. Yeah, I'd say it's 2020. You, know, you don't know unless you're in your those shoes, you know, how you would handle if you're innocent or if you're trying to cover up. But yeah, but now listening back to it now, knowing what we know, maybe he should have practiced it a little more in the mirror, you know? <laughs> or, or just don't do it. <laughs> don't do right, it right don't take the stand and 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 try to convince the jury you know the defense has said look they had already thought they lost the case once the judge let in all the financial crimes he's this lawyer uh that is lying that is stealing that you know so they didn't feel you know the risk of taking the stand and having that introduced because he's on the stand it was already in so they just thought here's our hail mary let's put him up there and see what he apparently felt like he had the ability to try to convince the jury. So it's a risk that didn't pay off for him. Yeah, I agree, though. I don't think it was a risk because I think it was done already. He had already been proven to have lied to everyone about where he was at the time of the murder. He needed to explain that. He needed to explain that face to face to this jury. He needed to look them in the eyes and tell them I didn't murder my wife and son. And we, we heard the way he did it there. And I'm listening to it. And it's just not that convincing. Now, as I was watching his testimony during the trial, um, I, I got the feeling this is a guy who was, who's looking to, he's, he's a salesman to me. He's more of a salesman than a lawyer. This is a guy who would never argue in front of the Supreme court. I mean, I would never argue in front of the Supreme court either. So it's not like I'm insulting him, but he's just a different kind of lawyer. He's the kind of lawyer who could win a jury trial. Um, he's the kind of lawyer who can convince a client that he's ripping off, that he's not ripping him off. He's the kind of lawyer who can convince his partners that everything's okay, despite the fact that there's like all this money missing. So I, I think he had that same mentality taking the witness stand that these are 12 folks from my neighborhood. I grew up here. I know my way around here. I know the way they are. I know the way they think. And I can convince them about not killing Paul, Paul. And Mags, you know, ultimately looking back, do they regret that decision? I'm sure Alec does, but would it have made a difference anyway? You know, would this jury have convicted him without him even taking the stand? Uh, the defense team seemed to think they would have held it against him for not taking the witness stand. So uh, they, again, like we said, thought this verdict was going to be guilty when the judge allowed all of the other evidence in. I know it's interesting. I listened to one of the jurors. I was on uh, an episode of Dr. Phil with him. I'm not <laughs> bragging, Chanley. I'm just saying I was on an episode of Dr. Phil with one of the jurors. And he said the financial crimes, he, he didn't even know why they put that in. He said he didn't need it. He didn't need any of that information. Yeah. So 
Um, the defense is reading it one way, but the jury read it another way. I mean, he lied about the biggest fact in the case. He was not convincing on the stand. The financial crimes had nothing to do with, with the verdict, which was which was fascinating to hear when I was on that episode mm-hmm. of Dr. That, Phil. Did I did I mention that? No, just, just if you've been Phil? on there a couple times, you know, you could. <laughs> <laughs> so let's take a listen now, because. To me, this was such a, a sound, uh, such a quote from Alec Murdoch, and it's a quote that the judge ends up reading back to him at his sentencing. Take a listen. Did you continue lying after that night? Did you not? Well, once I lied, I continued to lie. Yes, sir. Why? You know, oh, what a tangled web we weave. But once I told a lie... I mean, I told my family I, I had to keep lying. What I'm going to say, how is that going to help him? How does he, how in his mind, at that moment, I think he was melting. Like, like what a tangled web we weave is my defense. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, what else do you say to try to explain that? Yes, you're a liar. You lied, but I'm not lying now. Believe me now. It's now, I wouldn't use the I wouldn't use the tangled web. No, because we're still that. Zoom is still weaving the web, right? Of lies, and the judge even used, like you said, used that uh, in the sentencing. Of all the things he said on the stand, that's what the judge referred back to. And I, I remember it too. We did it. We we created a segment out of it using his words, and then following it up with all of his lies, and then finishing up with uh, the judge repeating his his words to him. Unbelievable. Um, well, here he is addressing these financial crimes that we've talked about, uh, because there is a lot of them and he's facing a lot of charges. Even my dog, I don't know if you can hear my dog, my dog in the background is angry about all these lies. Let's take a listen. All right, I'm just looking at the date of a check. So that's mm-hmm. December 20th, so that go, uh, 2011. So 2011. that gives us a ballpark. So that's 12 years ago. For me to sit here and tell you specifically that I remember sitting down and talking with Natasha Thomas, I, I can't tell you that. But what I can tell you, and mm-hmm. I can tell you that I didn't do right by Natasha Thomas. I took money from Natasha Thomas that didn't belong to me, and I was wrong for doing that. And I admit that. All right. And I know, Mr. Murdoch, that you would like for it just to be as simple as that, just to say, yes, ladies and gentlemen, I stole money and have that be the end of it. But in every single one of these cases, Objection to the comment, Your Honor. You just justified that you would like to just admit that. And make this quick, correct? Isn't that what you said? Isn't that what you implied? No, sir, Mr. Waters. You have charged me with murdering my wife and my son, and I have sat here for all these weeks listening to all this financial stuff that I did wrong, that I'm embarrassed by. I'm happy to talk to you about as much of that as you want to talk about. I'm required to talk about it as much as you want to talk about it. But the fact is, is I cannot specifically remember sitting down, the details that you're asking me for, I, I can't tell you. But what I can tell you is that in all these financial situations, I stole money that was not my money. I misled people that I shouldn't have misled, and I did wrong. I can tell you that. And and this sort of refrain was repeated many, many times during the course of his cross-examination. And at the end of the day, he's he's trying to admit it, and he's trying to he's almost trying to spin it in his favor that hey, I'm a stand-up guy. When I do something wrong, I admit it. Mm. I admit it, but not until you get caught. Right. Then, uh, and it, it was interesting how he tried to justify the stealing in his own mind, and it's almost as if that's what he was doing on the witness stand too, still trying to justify what he did, apologize, admit to what he did, play it down. It's it's it was an almost insurmountable hurdle for the defense to overcome. You know what's interesting, and I just thought about this, um, for Alec Murdoch in a courtroom, because he's a civil plaintiff's attorney. So he's usually on the side that I would equate with the prosecution, where he has, he's representing someone who's sympathetic. So when he, when he makes these arguments and these pleas to the jury, he's got something to back it up. In this case, he has nothing to back it up. There's nothing no reason to feel any sympathy for anything on his side of the case. So I think um, he's in a much different position 
as a defendant in this courtroom speaking directly to the jury than he ever was as a civil attorney. Because as a civil attorney, you're kind of like the good guy. Mm. You're fighting the man. And you're and you're trying to to, um, you know, get to the truth and help someone who's been harmed. Right. Much different situation here. Much different situation. Uncharted territory for him. And remember, the prosecution tried to take that uh, the fact that he was a plaintiff's attorney, that he was the closer, that he could go in in front of a civil jury, that he could make this emotional plea and just shed tear like, on you know, like an actor, like a shed a tear on, on cue. That was what the prosecution kept bringing up over and over again, trying to insinuate that's what he's doing in front of you now on this witness stand. And according to those jurors who spoke, they they caught on to that, meaning they, they agreed that it was all an act, that's something that he could just turn on and off like a light switch. And, and I'll tell you what, he, he may have been able to pull it off in front of this jury if he was on the other side prosecuting himself. Like if he was the prosecutor and he could have talked about the, the brutal murder of Paw Paw and Mags, it would have been a different, different case. And maybe he would have been interpreted a little bit differently, but he was, yeah, he was a little bit of a fish out of water because he's on the, on the other side of the case uh, here trying to convince this jury, which he did not. Um, Chanley Painter is with us. She's still in the low country. When we come back, um, let's talk about the lawyers, the closings and the verdict. But would a reasonable person remember those things? Would they not replay in their mind every day the last conversations that they had? Why would he remember that console story? Because he lies convincingly and easily, and he can do it at the drop of the hat. And you've heard testimony about that. He's been doing it to all the people who trust him for years. And he did it to y'all. That was uh, Creighton Waters, the prosecutor. What a job he did. That argument I love because he's he's proven during the course of this that he can lie to anyone and cheat anyone. Why wouldn't he lie to 12 strangers in a jury box when his life is on the line? I mean, what a way to attack his uh, credibility. Um, Chanley Painter with us in the Low Country. Chanley, Creighton Waters, um, you know, he took this case and put it on his back and it was a monster, a monster of a case that he had to take on because he knew he was taking on Alec Murdoch and the Murdoch legacy. I'm going to be able to speak with him again today. I want to know what was his first thought when he was assigned to this case? Is this something that he asked for? Did he want to try to be the one to take down the Murdoch legacy, the name that more than a century has ruled the part of the low country that he's going to have his jury trial in? You know, I want to, I want to know what he was thinking. Was this something he was excited about? Well, you can tell, Vinny, that he, either way, he dived in. And this was his life from the beginning. And he and he talked, I, I talked to him briefly on Friday. He talks about how he lived and breathed this trial, all the evidence of, well, from the beginning, but for these last six weeks uh, in the uh, hotel there in Walter Rural, and that he's quick to point to his teammates. And I think that also goes to show the kind of person that he is, that all the work that he put in, that he's giving credit to those who helped him get to where he is. And it was a big case. There was so much to remember and every little fact meant something. Uh, but what I, uh, what I loved about the way he presented this case and, and sort of framed the closing argument is that it all came back again to the big lie. I mean, you could take this case six weeks, all this evidence, all these witnesses, everything that happened, but you could really say it's a very simple case about three people being at the scene of the murder. Two of them died. One of them lied. And the one who lied, lied because, because he did it. And, you know, he had to do a lot. He had to overcome what was not perceived in the courtroom as the greatest investigation of a crime scene. Vinny, I think you should have helped write the closing argument because what you just said, two of them died, one of them lied. I would have taken that into the jury room and, okay, here we go. Let's make a decision. To me, that's that's the simplicity of, of a very complicated case when you, you break it down to its most basic element. Um, I don't think prosecutors have a case without the kennel videos. I think they have a case, but I don't, I don't think 
you could get over the hump. Certainly not in, in under three hours. No. With a jury. No, I mean, Creighton told me Friday after this that that Kindle video was crucial. He doesn't know that he could have gotten a conviction without that video to disprove the lie after lie after lie about Murdoch forcing him on the stand to explain it away. Now, what's interesting is the way the defense dealt with the big lie, right? Because, you know, it's it's not about him lying. It's what he lied about in this case, right? Yep. Which is the most important time period, the time period just before, like moments before the phone activity ends for two people and their lives end. And here's how the defense dealt with the lie. So, but really, we're back to the lie. We are back to the lie. Because um, that's all they have in this case, is that Alec lied to them when he was, when he last saw them. And he, and he shouldn't have. And he shouldn't have. And he said, what a tangled web we weave once we start to deceive. And once he lied the first time, he had, was stuck with the lie and he continued to lie. And he shouldn't have. He shouldn't have. And he told you, you know, what was going through his mind probably wasn't rational, but he was in the throes of an addiction and he just found his wife and son murdered. Mm. Hey, you know, it's interesting. And Jim Griffin's a great attorney, but attorneys are only as good as the facts surrounding their case. That's a tough sell for him. That's a tough sell. That's a tough sell. I don't I, I don't know if you could sell that to anyone. It would be extremely difficult because he lied about it until he couldn't lie anymore. Yep, until he was sitting in front of the jurors tasked with his fate in their hands is when he said he lied about some of his family members and he did not know until he took the stand and said he lied, that he was at the kennels. His friends that he told who, who, who rushed to the scene uh, to comfort him did not find out until he took the witness stand in his own defense. I asked Jim Griffin about this today, and he says that video does not show. That he says it helps the defense. Then he somehow he, the defense says that video helps his client because it doesn't show any anger or fighting or turmoil. It's a normal night. There, he's calling for the dog. Maggie probably has the water hose, uh, washing out the kennels. Um, how could someone, you know, with that type of vibe in a video only minutes later execute his family and so still even after this verdict the defense is saying that video trying to downplay you know it wasn't it, it does it's contradictory but the but the other part of this is i don't know how honest he was with his own lawyers until that video surfaced my guess is he was selling them the same garbage because uh, clients will do that i've heard that from defense attorneys well, I asked him about that. I asked him about that, and I'm not going to give the answer here. I want people to tune into your show. Okay. Got to watch the show, folks. <laughs> and, and to me, it's, it's significant because I, I just know through the years, I've talked to many defense attorneys, and they say, you know, they're not honest with us. <laughs> they're not honest with us all the time. So, um, you know, the other part of this case that was different than most that we covered is the victims. And I, I felt like... The victims got shortchanged a little bit. And I know who, people who have seen these Netflix series, HBO documentaries, and others may have feelings about the Murdochs in general, that they're not likable, you don't like them, they're not sympathetic, et cetera, privileged. Um, but two people are dead who should not be dead. And there's just no way. They should not be dead. Paul Murdoch, if he was guilty, and and I think he was, of, and the boat crash, should have uh, you know had his day of judgment and been punished for what he did, but then have the ability to do whatever else he was going to do with the rest of his life. Uh, Maggie Murdoch should not have been hunted down like a wild hog on the property with an AR blackout rifle. No way, no way, no matter what you think about her. And I, I haven't really heard anything negative about her, but I'm, I'm just saying, like, if you don't like the Murdochs, the fact that two Murdochs are dead, uh, those two Murdochs should be alive. But that was the one part of this case that no one was really there, there for the victims here. Yeah. Here's what the, the, uh, the state said in their rebuttal closing argument. And one was Paul. He didn't testify to you up on the stand, but he testified to Dr. Raymond. And he testified to his And 
Here is so beautiful of evidence. It's so pure. <laughs> he didn't know he took that video. That's why he said he wasn't down there. And this is beyond all that. We respectfully salute him. Paul knew. Dad, I got some insurance. I got some insurance. Not the kind of insurance you've made money off of. An insurance some clients you gave back and some you didn't. I've got some insurance on you. Fascinating argument. But really, it was Paul recording that video that was never sent to anyone that remained in his phone for months until it could be retrieved. That was the big piece of evidence. It was the most important piece of evidence. And it was as if Paul was speaking from the grave. He helped solve his murder. Bubba, the dog, he, needs, he deserves more credit than he, he helped solve this murder. If he hadn't gone after that chicken. So it's crucial. Uh, and this is, you know, John Metter, you know, listening to his voice. What a, I get to meet him today. I'm really excited, by the way. Be on the lookout for the interview with uh, John Metter's on your show as well. Absolutely. So yeah. continue Chanley, because this to me is, is such a big, big part of everything. It really is. Uh, this video, the, that moment, uh, the jurors point to that video as the biggest piece of evidence. Some say quote sealed the deal for them in this video. Um, and the perpetrator did not know this video existed though. There's some suspicion from investigators, and again, I, I sit down with a couple of the deputies who respond to that scene video. They tell me, and these are photos that we couldn't see because they're under seal, of how that cell phone, Paul's cell phone, was found on his behind uh, his body, and they say Paul's body was was wet. It had been raining, but it was almost like he was washed with the water hose, and that phone on his body was dry. No DNA, no fingerprint, like it had been wiped clean. Somebody may have, you know, the perpetrator picked it up, you know, tried to get something to see if there was evidence, didn't have the passcode and set it back down. And we know Alec at one point says, you know, he tried to roll Paul's body over, his phone popped out, and he, he tried to pick it up, thought he'd do something with it, put it back down. But it, there's no, there's nothing on this phone. It's, it's clean. Maybe tried to lock it, make sure it was locked in case there was anything on it, because it took them months to unlock it. You know, you, you, they, they couldn't break it for quite some time until they found this video in March, in March of the following year, completely changed the case. So let's get to the verdict. Well, let's, let's take a listen to it. And then when we come on the other side, Chandler, I want you to describe for everyone what it was like being in there for this moment. Docket number 2022 GS 15 the state of South Carolina, County of Colleton, in the Court of General Sessions in the term of 2022, July, the state versus Richard Alexander Murdoch defendant, indictment for murder, SC code 16-3-0010, CDR code 0116. Okay. Guilty. Verdict signed by the four lady three two twenty three. Docket number two thousand twenty two dash GS dash fifteen dash zero zero five nine three. The state of South Carolina, County of Colleton, in the Court of General Sessions, the July term of two thousand twenty two. The state versus Richard Alexander Murdoch, defendant, indictment for murder. SC code 16-3-0010, CDR code 0116, verdict guilty, signed by the four lady, date 3-2 of 23. All right, Chanley, take us there. Vinny, we sit through a lot of verdicts. This one, everything pretty typical up until a point. This one, eerily silent. The judge warned everyone, don't make a peep. And, and no noise. So all we're hearing, the verdict read. But the moment that I will take away with me from this verdict is when Alec Murdoch is remanded to the custody of the sheriff. And he, and, he, and he turns around to be handcuffed for the first time in that courtroom. And he looks to his son, Buster, who 
who's sitting back there, he mouths, I love you. And you can hear the clanking, the clicking of the handcuffs, it's all we hear. And then he's, he turns to walk out in front of the jury who just convicted him. I, I tried to see if he looked up at any of them. From what I could tell, he looked down, didn't try to make eye contact with that jury. But that moment sent chills down my spine to think what that means for the family, what that means for Buster, who's been there faithful to sit behind his father every single day of the trial. So stoic and strong. I couldn't do that thing. I, I'd be a wreck. Especially the nature of, of everything involved in this case, because it's his mother and, and his brother who were murdered. His father's on trial. His father's now convicted. The, the, the jury has told him, listen, your father murdered your mother and your brother. It's got to be almost impossible for him to find a place to acknowledge that. I mean, he may someday, he may already be there. I don't know. But from what I've seen, most children stuck in the middle, the way uh, Buster is in this case, um, usually support the surviving parent, regardless of what the jury says. And he will never be able to touch his dad again. His dad's gone in prison for the rest of his life. Basically lost him too. Maybe talk on the phone with him, but his life will never be the same. Forever change. The, I guess the, the good news is that it's, it, he's a Murdoch. So he's got his uncles. Yes, um, who are so... He's got his aunt. He's got support. So supportive, Vinny. John Marvin made the point to sit down there by Buster at the reading of the verdict. He had his arm around him. And there was one point you know, after Alec had left, John Marvin turned to Buster and he says, are you okay? You know, because we can leave, you know, they, they could leave at any moment they wanted to, according to the, the bailiff security in charge of the family there. Buster nodded as if he was okay. He mean, they stayed. Wow. Yeah, it's, it's a tough road for him. And again, whatever you think of the Murdochs, at the end of the day, um, two people are dead who should not be dead. And a third, uh, Buster, is now going to live a really, really strange, strange existence. I mean, he was in court every day with his girlfriend slash fiance, Brooklyn. Um, if they get married and they have children, I mean, what do you tell them about grandpa and grandma and Uncle Paul and all these things that they're going to read on the internet when they research their name. It's it's not easy. It's not an easy life, but it was the whole mess is created by Alec. That's the bottom line. That is absolutely the bottom line here. All right, when we come back, we'll talk a little bit about a sentencing and some of the post-verdict reaction. Uh, Chanley has spoken to everyone, and, and we'll get a little bit more on that. Uh, don't go away. Your Honor, um, Mr. Griffin and I would have no comment. The defendant would like to address the court, though. Mr. Murdoch. Good morning, Your Honor. I'm innocent. I would never hurt my wife, Maggie, and I would never hurt my son, Paul Paul. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. Paul Paul. Let's talk about that for just a second, Chanley. Alec referring to his son, Paul, as Paul Paul. Now, is it Paul, Paul, or Paw, Paw? Like a dog's paw? Do we know if he's saying like Paw, Paw, or Paul, Paul? Well, according to his phone records, Paul's number was stored in his phone as Paul, Paul. So he's saying Paul, Paul, not Paw, Paw. Okay, so it's the Paul, accent. Paul. It sounds like, yeah. It's good. Yep. It's no, Southern I get accent. It. I, I've got a yes. little bit of an accent, too. People tell me. I don't know. I don't hear it. Some people say I talk. It comes out sometimes more more times than other, depending on what you're talking about. <laughs> some pe some people say I talk a little different than others. I don't know. I don't know what they're talking about. But let's <laughs> let's talk about the sentencing day. Now, this was really the first time we've seen Alec Murdoch in a courtroom not wearing the jacket and the khakis and the nice shirt. He's dressed a little differently. Oh yeah, first thing I noticed it was a brown issued jail jumpsuit, a typical jailhouse sandals handcuffs still on him inside the courtroom different alec murdoch and you could read it on his body language too that day he was he was done he's defeated he yeah. was defeated he, he couldn't sell it he couldn't sell it 
You know, for years he was able to sell to people that he didn't have a drug problem, that he was an honest lawyer, that he wasn't cheating them. Uh, but in the end, he couldn't sell them that he did not murder his wife and son. Let's take a listen to the judge uh, issuing the uh, sentences for Alec Murdoch, and then we'll talk a little bit about Judge Newman, who really one of the breakout stars of this whole thing. In the murder of your wife, Maggie Murdoch, I sentence you for the term of the rest of your natural life. For the murder of Paul Murdoch, whom you probably love so much. I sentence you to prison for murdering him for the rest of your natural life. Those sentences will run consecutive. So consecutive, that means he's, he's more than done. More than done. Yeah, he's got his appeal. Yada, yada, yada. Every criminal defendant has their appeal. So Chanley, the thing about Judge Newman was we've covered all different types of trials with different judges, with different personalities. Some are gregarious, some are angry. Um, but I've never seen one as respected and as soft-spoken, that combination that he never has to raise his voice to command the attention and respect of everyone inside that courtroom. Vinny, I've been a fan of Judge Newman since the Nathaniel Rowland trial we covered. I'm so impressed with him then. And yes, he has a way about him, maybe soft-spoken, but he's effective. And people listen, and they stop to listen to him. And uh, just, you know, he has this quiet confidence about him as well in his body language. And so he's about to retire. Uh, we're, we're sad that he's, uh, he's not going to be on the bench much longer, but uh, he's had a great Great career. Great career. And finishes with a with a big one. Um, so steady, so um, down the middle. I mean, obviously, the defense is going to say we didn't get some rulings. But, you know, the rulings were going both ways. But then doors were opened. Yeah. Doors were opened by the defense during the case. <laughs> you know? Um, yeah. And I just love the way he would say, you know, he would let the lawyers be lawyers. He would let the witnesses testify. But if he needed to stop things. He knew how to stop it. And he had the great rapport with the jury, which I think is another reason why they're able to reach a verdict and perhaps reach a verdict so quickly because of the instructions that were so clear from Judge Newman. So um, speaking of, of, of prosecuting uh, and prosecutors, let's take a listen to um, Creighton Waters here talking about this cross-examination technique for Alec Murdoch. I think the second that they put in a defense exhibit, I knew that was going to happen. But I also knew who this individual was. He had been able to talk his way out of trouble. He had been able to avoid accountability all his life. Uh, he um, it was very clear that he felt like this is his community and his people, and he was going to be able to look them in the eye and convince them of this story. But here's the difference here, and this is why I did the cross-examination the way I did. I wanted to get him talking. Mm -hmm. I wanted him to run his mouth as long as he could. I had pauses on right. purpose because he couldn't stand it. He would start talking on his own. That's not a typical cross-examination, but this is a different draw. I, mm -hmm. I started out constructive and then went destructive. Mm -hmm. I wanted him to talk because I knew that he would look that jury in the eye and be so convincing and compelling, mm -hmm. and then he was going to talk on cross-examination, and they were going to realize he could lie to me too, and I think that's what happened. <laughs> it's genius. It's genius by Creighton Waters, and, and it absolutely worked. Um, and just so for folks at, at home not familiar with what he's talking about, typical cross-examination, typical cross-examination is like if you ever watched the old show Perry Mason, and every question would be, isn't it true, blah, 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 isn't it true, blah, 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 isn't it? Those are leading questions where the question itself um, infers an answer, and, and it doesn't even matter what the answer is. It's kind of like the lawyer you know, testifying and just in such a rapid fire kind of way. Creighton Waters went the opposite way, Chanley. He did. And there was some speculation. Oh, what is he doing? You know, we shouldn't let Malik talk object, you know, control the witness as we're trained to do when we cross examine someone. But it was all strategic. And uh, he knew what he was doing. The jury knew what he was doing because jurors have spoken since and they, they, they got it. They're smart. They use their common sense. And, uh, and it, uh, ultimately, won the day. It was a successful strategy. Big bucket of common sense, right? You, you, you can't be a robot when you're doing anything, especially trying a case. You have to, you have to read the room 
understand the witness. And that's exactly what Creighton Waters did. Great job. All right, let's take a listen to the defense afterwards. And I'm going to have a few things to say about this. Swed needs to do some self-examination on the forensic processing. They did not. I mean, one of the things we complained about was that Maggie's phone would have had all her GPS data on it if they processed it within five days. Um, and they, they, because they didn't, the GPS data got overridden. I mean, it was just one, which would have been helpful to Alec, is fingerprints, footprints, and all kinds of forensic things that weren't done. Let me give you a little inside information, ladies and gentlemen, if you're listening. Whenever a defense relies upon a sloppy investigation, a tainted crime scene, um, that means they don't have anything. That means they don't have anything. They don't have any evidence themselves that points in any other direction. What they want the jury to do is imagine what could have been if it was a perfect investigation. And just as a little side note, I don't know if Chanley will agree with me or not, because she's a former prosecutor also. I never heard a defense attorney get up in court and say, you know what? Investigators did a great job at the crime scene. They really did a great job. So basically what they're saying is that the, the defense bar as a general, like every criminal defense attorney from coast to coast, no investigation is ever done well, especially when it results in the arrest of their client. Right. Of course not, Vinny. Otherwise, my client wouldn't have been arrested. You would have got the right person responsible if the investigation had been done properly. Uh, but, you know, at the beginning, remember when it was just intense on cross-examination with the investigators and and. We knew what they were doing, right? I mean, we see trials all the time and defense attorneys try to poke holes and you didn't test this, you didn't mark this, or, you know, it wasn't their job to do that. And there may have been an explanation to it that, you know, prosecutors could bring up on rehabilitation. But for a while, they were thinking maybe there was something wrong with this investigation. And some of those investigators, you know, you know, looking back, maybe I should have took more pictures or, or, or done this. Uh, but ultimately, that didn't affect the outcome of the case. You know, just real quick, I, I spoke to some of those deputies who went underwent that cross-examination on the stand about what they did and what they didn't do when they arrived at that scene, Vinny, especially those footprints. Remember that buddy, bloody footprint uh, that the defense keeps referring to? We never really got an explanation about. It was left there when they were removing Paul's body. They had finished the scene. They were done, and they were collecting his body to take it away for autopsy. And that's when that bloody footprint was left there. So that's just one example of how the defense can kind of spin a little something. Absolutely. To make it appear of what it, what it may not have been. The bottom line, if there was someone else there, there would be some piece of evidence somewhere that would indicate that. But there was no one there. We've been to that scene. The jury visited the scene. It's in the middle of nowhere. Um, it, with the with the timeline as it was constructed, based upon all the digital evidence that was uh, presented, the the people would have had to snuck onto the property. I don't know, maybe parked half a mile down this this country road, and then walked to the crime scene, tiptoed around so the dogs didn't hear them, so Alec didn't hear them, and no one knew they were there. And then they just happened to know that Maggie and Paul were there that night, and they were just waiting for Alec to go to his mother's house. And then they would pounce. That's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. It's not reasonable. Reasonable doubt needs to be reasonable. And it just wasn't. There was no evidence of anything, Chanley. There wasn't. That was one of the strongest arguments in Creighton's clothes, you know, common sense. And, and I thought it was, he took it a step further saying, you know, Alec kept saying, I got out of there. You know, I got my golf cart. I got out of there just in time. Why wouldn't he say, I wanted to, I wish I had stayed. Just two more minutes longer. I wish I had been there. I was there. And I wish I had been there longer so I could help save my wife and son. That that moment in closing, I think, really was a turning point for him. It was great. It was a great way to take something that no one's thinking about until the closing argument. And you spring that on the jury, and it's like, wow, exactly. None of this makes sense. This is not how someone would act or react. It's not what I would do. It's not what any any father would do. Yeah. And by the way, the fact he's got no blood on him to me is ridiculous. Mm -hmm. I mean, your wife and your son are on the ground. Are you not hugging them? Are you not trying CPR? Are you not touched? Do you really care? No, I, I knew in the back of my mind, I didn't want to disturb anything. Yeah. Yeah. You and Rabbi Fred Newlander had the same approach to the crime scene. And both of you <laughs> ended up in the same place because you're both guilty. 
Okay. Little tangent there. And then he and this person had to know there happened to be guns there. They just, the family weapons. Yeah, they, they, got didn't, to know, they didn't bring their own guns. Conveniently, conveniently there. <laughs> we didn't bring our own guns right. to this murder. We decided they there's going to be a gun there. We don't need it. Hey, Bob, do we need to bring a gun? Nah, they'll have guns there. We'll just take the guns and we'll shoot them with their own guns. It's genius. Come on. Set up. We'll set up Alec Murdoch. Yeah. And, you know, if it was a frame, it would have been framed, I think, a little more if it was a frame, right? I mean, it would have been a little more. Oh, yeah, yeah. Evidence pointing to him. I don't know. Yeah. The more yeah. you think about it, yeah. You, and, and that's what I would implore all of you listening. If you end up on a jury, wh- whichever way it goes, I don't care. But don't be afraid to use your common sense because you're allowed to. And they did in this case. Chanley Painter, please take a bow. Amazing job. I'm not talking about just this podcast. I'm talking about her coverage of this story from the beginning. Not just the trial. She was in the low country when this, right after this first happened, she was on the ground uh, reporting for us and then uh, is continuing to do that. Um, she now has, has purchased a home and she's almost finished her more. <laughs> she's almost finished paying off the house that she owns now in the low country. She's been, been there so, so long. long. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Chanley, thanks so much. Thanks so much. Thank you, Vinny. All right, folks. Thank you for downloading and listening to the court TV podcast. Check the show notes for links to a lot of the moments from the trial and, and, uh, other pieces of information that can help you with this story. Um, If you want the best in uh, true crime night after night, please watch my program every night from 8 to 10 on Court TV. In the meantime, thank you so much for listening. Have a great week. And as always, please don't forget to hug the kids. This podcast is a production of Court TV. Go to CourtTV.com for more content, trials on demand, and to find out how to watch Court TV in your area.